Uh, my name is Randall Kempner. I am the Executive Director of the Aspen Network of Development Entrepreneurs, or ANDI for short. Um, I knew that I had become a success when people stopped calling me Andy and realized that I actually did have my own name, so this was a big accomplishment for us uh, in the organization. Uh, Andy is a policy program of the Aspen Institute, and we are focused on trying to support small business entrepreneurship in emerging markets as a means to develop prosperity for those countries. So um, just briefly about Andy, we have about 200 members that range from very large corporations, um, so Walmart, Nestle, Citi, J.P. Morgan, to universities like Stanford and Michigan and Duke and University of Cape Town uh, and uh, Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, Colombia, to um, technical assistance organizations like Oxfam and Technoserve. Uh, we also have consulting firms, McKinsey and Monitor and EY. Uh, and we critically have uh, about 60 impact investing funds um, that are part of this network and are dedicated in our case to trying to support small and growing businesses in emerging markets. So it is from that, that experience and working with that particular goal and uh, impact investing funds that I want to share with you all a little bit about impact investing in emerging markets. Does that make sense? So um, as a start, one of the things that we often do in uh, Andy's world is we do something called informational aerobics. Normally I make people stand up but because it's early enough, I'm going to just use your hands. So if you're breathing, raise your hand. It should be just about everyone. Okay. Now keep your, keep your hands up. If you have um, not really heard of impact investing, if you're really new to the space, keep your hand up. Everyone else can put your hand down. Okay, so there's some of you. If you have, you can go ahead and put them down, but we're going to keep playing the game a little bit. Um, if you have heard of impact investing but don't really know what it is, raise your hand. Okay, a few of you. If you are an impact investor, raise your hand. Just one, two. All right, I'm going to call on both of you. Um, and then the, the next question was, um, do you all believe, if there are just two of you, that you are likely to have the same definition of impact investing? And the answer to that is no. And one of the things that I want to do today uh, is try to share a definition, at least the way that, that I and Andy approach it, and try to put a stake in the ground for what impact investing actually means. In addition to that, I want to talk a little bit about the history of it and sort of how we got there. Then I want to talk about the anatomy of impact investing, uh, and then some of the challenges and opportunities that exist for impact investing in emerging markets. I am hoping that I will be done in 15 or 20 minutes, and then I want to have lots of questions. And let's try to make it a conversation because we're not that big. So that work for folks? OK. So let's start at this definition. I've tried to provide the simplest and shortest definition that I can find that I think actually works. So impact investing or impact investments are investments intended to create positive impact beyond financial return. Investments intended to create positive impact beyond financial return. So it seems simple, but let me unpack this a little bit. The first word is important. An impact investment is an investment. So many times, um, foundations and philanthropic organizations talk about their investments, and they mean grants. A grant is not an investment, in large part because a grant does not expect financial return. So if you think about philanthropy, you give away money with the intent for positive impact, but you have a negative infinity financial return in most cases. You are giving the money away. And that can be a wonderful thing, but it's not an impact investment. It's a grant with the intent of trying to create positive impact. So investments are, by definition, seeking some, at least, financial return. But in the impact investing world, you may be willing to accept financial return below what would be considered the risk-adjusted rate of return for market-based investments. So that's a key piece. Um, positive impact. So the idea here is that besides the financial return, you want to achieve some social or environmental goal as a result of your investment. You get to pick which one. <laughs> you could care about uh, saving the whales. You could care about uh, supporting uh, communities of indigenous peoples in Bolivia. You could care about making sure that women have opportunities to get jobs in Kenya or in Kentucky. But there is 
as part of this a need to specifically identify what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And this gets to this other important word, intention. One of the challenges that we have in impact investing today is that many people will look back and say, well, this was an impact investing because, investment because we created jobs or because we had some environmental positive impact. For most people in the space, if you don't intend to have that impact, it doesn't count. And the way that we look at intention is by asking the question, well, how are you going to measure your impact? And a real impact investor will have an answer to that question up front. So there needs to be some consideration ahead of time of what the positive goal is that you have, and also a commitment to measuring that goal and thinking about that up front. Okay, so investments intended to create positive impact beyond financial return. So pause for a second. Does that make sense to people? Clarify a little bit? Okay, so if, if that's what we're all trying to do, sort of how did we get here? And I'm sorry that this is a kind of a busy slide, but it, I'll try to unpack it a little bit. It's kind of, you know, the, the classic question of where do you fit? Where do you enter this consulting two by two graph? And if you enter it from the philanthropic side and from the international development perspective, this is where actually the original impact investors came from. You're coming to it from the philanthropic perspective. A lot of what's driving this is people are frustrated by the international development enterprise. There's books like Dead Aid, right, and The Aid Trap. You know, people look and see that we've spent billions and billions of dollars on international development that typically goes to governments and most people are dissatisfied with the overall impact that we've had. And so from this emerged a willingness to explore not traditional philanthropic approaches, but market-based approaches to addressing poverty. That says, well, maybe we can leverage um, the idea of business and entrepreneurship, and social entrepreneurship specifically, to address social challenges and environmental challenges in emerging markets. So it says, hey, it might be actually better for our overall intention to see the creation of companies that get financial investment and have the market discipline of paying back money to their investors because if they have to do that, they are more likely to have a sustainable business model and if they are providing services to the poor, solar lighting, um, if they're doing training services and education, so lots of, of private educational um, programs have come up this way, that they are going to be better off if they actually have the discipline of the market and get impact investment as opposed to grants. So you know, following this, you find lots of development financial institutions and aid institutions that are trying to put more and more money into these private sector or market-based approaches using impact investment. On the other side, if you're coming out of this from the investment side, if you are a, a Wall Street investor, you're a private equity person, what you're finding is that um, first of all, there's, there's kind of a cultural shift toward wanting to have an impact beyond your financial impact. So we've all been listening to the discussions about millennial generation uh, and, and a greater sense of social need and understanding that, you know what, I can make money and have a social impact. So you have that trend, but there's also just a recognition that impact investments are often counter-cyclical. If you are investing in companies that are serving the poor, they are typically providing products and services for people who will always need them. So those companies are not dependent upon traditional market, uh, stock market trends. They go against what typically happens. You could have a huge depression um, in the United States and people in Africa are still going to need to eat. And if companies there are able to produce food for the poor people or they are able to provide electricity or they're able to provide health care, that doesn't go away. So from a purely financial perspective, there's actually some rationale for thinking about these kinds of investments. So there's both kind of a, a cultural shift that's driving this and also a financial uh, assessment shift that's driving this. And often what you see in impact investing um, is that to actually make deals happen, you need to have both the financial first investors, so those that say, look, I need to make X percent financially, and beyond that, I'm excited to have a social or environmental impact. So that's the financial first. Then you've also got the impact first. It says, well, I really care about making sure that you know, X hundreds of thousands of people get jobs, or that we are able to provide clean energy to uh, communities in rural Africa. And then beyond that, if I make some money, that's great. 
So a lot of the, the alchemy of impact investing right now is how do you get those two groups together and create deals that are useful for the companies in which you're actually investing. So again, let me pause here. Does that make sense? I want to look at my impact investors in particular. Am I gone, gone offline yet? Okay. So if that's a little bit about sort of how we got here, there are lots of, of trends that are pushing this. We're talking about a lot. It is still something, however, which is really challenging to do. Um, so let me, let me start with the anatomy part. I promised anatomy. So back to a little bit of a roadblock. Everyone, hold up your hands. Look at your pinky. You can wave at everyone a little. So if you look at your pinky, that surface area of your pinky compared to your entire body is impact investing versus total managed investment in the world today. It is tiny. According to the Global Impact Investment Network, $46 billion of impact investing was done uh, in the last year, or actually was money that was raised by impact investing vehicles. There's about $80 trillion, which is in total global managed assets. And you actually have to look at your fingernail on your pinky to see the amount of impact investments that have actually been made. So this space is still today obviously nascent. We are in the startup phase. And even though more impact investing has actually been done in emerging markets and developed countries, um, I suspect that's going to switch because of some of the challenges that I want to talk about. There's a good reason why this space is still nascent despite all the growing interest that we're hearing. So the first thing, and I want to just kind of quickly go through this wheel, and, and then I'm going to open it up for questions about this or anything else you'd want um, related to the topic. These are sort of five things that you have to do from an investor perspective if you're going to be successful um, in building an impact investing industry. The first thing, obviously, is you have to raise capital. And if you are an investment fund, a fund manager, you will find that it's really actually quite difficult to raise capital for an impact investing fund. And the reason starts with it's a new space. Investors, limited partners, want to put money into people with track records. Well, you can't really have a track record in a brand new space. So that's hard. And the other thing that's true today is that there are not that many institutions that are actually willing to put money into impact investing at all. The reality is there is a lot of talk, but not a lot of action. And so it is hard to find investors that have money that are willing to bet at all, no matter what your track record is. So it is one of these chicken and egg things where you end up starting with small funds and people who are willing to take bets and a significant reliance upon development financial institutions and aid agencies and government entities, philanthropic entities, not the traditional mainstream investment community that's driving this growth right now. So it's hard to raise the money. Even harder is actually finding good deals. So you would think that given the thousands of businesses of social enterprises that exist in the world, you would be able to find good opportunities. But the problem is that the vast majority of these social enterprises are still lacking the talent that's necessary to actually scale their company. We spend a lot of time working in Africa, a lot of time working in, in Latin America. And we hear time and time again from the investors and from the, the entrepreneurs that it's incredibly difficult to find good middle management, the kinds of people that you need to grow a company. And so as investors will always say, the most important thing is the team. The teams are often weak in developing country contexts. And so it's hard to find that talent. And even if you can find a business um, that might have the talent, it's still very difficult then to make the deal. So there's a lack of quantity of these companies. There's a lack of quality. You find the great ones, and then all of a sudden you have to figure out what's the right investment vehicle to make this happen. And what you find in most emerging markets is that the entrepreneurs, for very good reason, are unwilling to give up a controlling stake of their company, while many of the investors would like to have a 50% stake or more. So there's kind of a mismatch, and that's driven by a cultural challenge of trust. Most emerging market entrepreneurs are as, as fiercely independent as the entrepreneurs you'd find here, and they are even less trustworthy of institutions and organizations outside of their families and their, their, their close-knit or, or close circle of trust. So it's, you've got a problem to overcome there. <clears throat> and then the other challenge is that um, in many cases, there are challenges in finding legal support 
of finding banks to, to back deals, all the other elements that you might need to bring into the ecosystem or into the partnership group are not typically exit in emerging markets. So a real problem in actually doing the deal and structuring it. If you were successful in making deals happen, then you have to worry about the long-term support of these businesses and actually measuring the impact. That's also really hard. You think measuring financial return is hard? Not so hard relative to whether you're actually creating jobs, whether you are actually improving the lives of poor. And so we spend a lot of time in Andy trying to create tools that are low cost and easy to use that can be leveraged if you're trying to understand your ultimate impact on a poor household in an emerging market country. It is well beyond what you have to do if you're just making a financial investment. And the other piece of this is that you need to support these companies typically greater than you would in the context of a regular investment that you're making in a private equity sense. All the venture capital firms and private equity firms talk about the value added services that they offer to their investments in this country. But these are firms typically, these social enterprises, that need a lot more help than the firms that are receiving this kind of investment in a developed market. So they need help on the talent side. They need help with financial management. They need help in building out their marketing strategies. So it costs more to support these kinds of businesses. There is a need for greater capacity development services. So achieving the impact is harder, and then measuring it is also harder. And then finally, exits. You know, part of this whole structure is a challenge because most investors do ultimately want to get out in some way. And that happens in, again, in developed countries. You've got stock markets. You see IPOs. You've also got really rich opportunities for buyouts. In developed countries, the vast majority don't have stock markets. There are not lots of middle market funds that will buy out stakes. So you have to build in the exit. You have to have a, buyer, um, a buyout by the, um, by the entrepreneur, typically. And you have to get creative about ways in which you, as an investor, make sure you start getting some of your funding back. So this whole circle uh, represents the fact that while it is happening, there are still lots that needs to be done in order to, to kind of strengthen the overall industry. And I'm happy to talk about a number of the kind of solutions that are emerging to these challenges. But I just wanted to start by laying them out there and sort of seeing whether they made sense and, and gave you a good, a good sense of what's going on. So with that. I'm going to finish and say thank you for listening to my presentation. And I've got my email up there and the, the name of the organization where we have a lot more information. But let's use the 30 or so minutes we have now to sort of have a good discussion. Okay. Thanks. And, and sorry, would you say your name? and? impact for social impact investing firms that you think are really doing terrific work. I'm sure you come across a number of them and maybe some anecdotes of the good work that you're seeing and the impact that it's having it would be the first. And then the second is maybe talk a little bit about entrepreneurship in these emerging markets, since that's, I assume, at the core of what you're looking to try to find and support and any comments that you can make, what countries you think do this particularly well and what infrastructure you're trying to build to help encourage that. Sure, happy to do that. Um, so first of all, that is a wonderful opportunity to shill for our state of the sector report, available online for free, in which we talk about a lot of those questions. So I'm going to give you some answers, but I want to encourage you all to go to the website to, to pick this up. So in terms of funds, I mean, it's it's I will give you some that have been around for a while and people look to. Um, there's a one called Acumen Fund, which has been around for 10 years. Um, they are very much focused on significant social impact. They are impact first. Um, a lot of respect for what they've been doing uh, throughout the world. And they have um, activities in Africa and the Middle East and, and now actually in Latin America. There's a group called the Grassroots Business Fund, which also has been around for a while. It's a spin out of um, the IFC. Um, they do mostly work in Africa and Latin America as well, but have had some real success stories, uh, particularly in uh, some of the garment industry and also sort of rugs. Um, they also have some, some work in agriculture, which has been very successful. Uh, there's another firm called Root Capital, 
um, which is specifically focused on trying to support agricultural cooperatives and helping them make connections to multinational companies that are trying to buy those products. Um, so peppers, and they do a lot of work in coffee. They do work in, um, in uh, other foodstuffs as well, where they provide a lot of capacity development services to those companies um, and those cooperatives, and then actually, as I say, help them uh, do market entry in developed countries. So those would be three to take a look at. Um, there's another actually really cool one called INP, um, Investeurs et Partenaires, pardon my French, um, which is based in Paris and works specifically in West Africa. They've created a venture capital fund um, in uh, Burkina Faso, I mean, in some pretty, really, really difficult places and have had some success in trying to build out the industry there. So that was question one. Um, question two was some of the countries, right, in which? Just more about entrepreneurship generally. Generally. Well, so, I mean, how would I say that? L let, me, let me try to answer it this way, that, that entrepreneurs are everywhere. That the entrepreneurial spirit exists in every country in the world, um, but the ability to uh, practice the trade of entrepreneurship um, is hindered by a whole variety of obstacles in most countries. And so what we find is that most small business entrepreneurs uh, face three big challenges. And I talked a little bit about some of them. But from the entrepreneurial perspective, the first one is talent. They have a really hard time, as I mentioned, trying to find the teams that they need to grow their companies. The second one is market information and market access. There's a real lack of understanding of how to do market segmentation and market assessment by most of the businesses with which we work. And also just a lack of data to support that. So there is a problem on the information and knowledge side. And then there are also physical impediments to market access, roads, energy infrastructure. Uh, and then you have the regulatory barriers. So you can't move certain types of agricultural products from you know, Kenya to Tanzania because of pure regulatory barriers that don't seem to make any sense. So market entry problems are significantly. And then we talk about capital. Most people say it's capital first and then talk about the other things. There's actually money out there, but the money isn't going to chase businesses that don't have the talent and don't have the marketing strategy and the market access that they need to thrive. So those three issues, though, talent, market, and capital, you consistently find as the key three challenges that these businesses are facing in emerging markets and are a lot of what our members are trying to address through a variety of different projects. Um, and sort of following up on that, in terms of countries, there's a lot of activity today in Kenya, uh, a lot in Brazil, a growing amount in South Africa. Um, it tends to be the larger, uh, slightly more developed countries in which you're seeing more social entrepreneurship thriving, more impact investing. Uh, but there's actually interest um, across every emerging market country that you can find. There's somebody trying to do this in some way. Other questions? This gentleman. Thank you. you. You talked about building measurement tools and, and ways to measure impact. Could you please give more examples about that and successes and failures in terms of, you know, five years, ten years out, what has worked and what has not worked? Yeah, so if I, I'll start sort of at the beginning. It's a real challenge in this space to try to find a way of measuring impact which is comparable and of high quality. And so there is a major initiative right now called IRIS, the Impact Reporting Investment Standards, which has been created specifically to create a taxonomy of the various types of measures that you might want to use. So it's basically saying, if you're going to measure full-time employment, can we please use the same definition of full-time employment? Because obviously that could be different around the world. And there are 450 or so different metrics for which they're trying to standardize the dictionary that one might use. And they've made a lot of progress uh, in trying to build a, a set of standards, metric standards for that. So that's a success story, except the challenge is less in building the dictionary than it is in actually implementing the process on the ground where you are trying to get data about full-time employment, or let's say the number of, um, of, uh, of solar lights that you distributed. Um, from companies that are not set up to have a good in-house metrics staff to do that kind of work. So it's actually the big challenges in the application. 
and, and even further than getting information from the companies, how do you get information from the households that you are trying to ultimately impact? Because frankly, at the end of the day, this isn't about helping companies. Right? I often like to say, I actually don't care about business, per se. I care about helping poor people in developing countries. It just so happens that the only way that I'm competent to do that is by supporting businesses. And I do fundamentally believe in the power of markets to be helpful if it's harnessed right. But you've got to get to the level of the household. And so on those two levels, what we're finding is obviously that mobile phones uh, become the right tool to leverage. And in particular, at the household level, you need to find a way where they, often who are illiterate, can either via voice commands or just simple numbers, can, can fulfill surveys. And so we're actually in the process right now of doing some research into various poverty measurement tools and which tend to have better applications in various countries and in which contexts. So there is um, a fair amount of work that's going on in the research community looking into that, and a lot of it's on our website. But I can't say that we've had a success yet. I think we've been successful in identifying the challenges. I think IRIS is a success in coming up with how you should define the measures. But actually doing it effectively in a cost-effective way is, is something that we're still thinking. Is that maybe part of a precondition in terms of deploying investments? I mean, you, you mentioned you know, all the challenges, but maybe the, the actual measurement should be put onto the entrepreneur? Well, so I mean, I think people would argue that one of the reasons this is still growing in a linear way instead of in an exponential way is that there is not consistent measurement that allows investors, particularly the impact-first investors, to be comfortable that they're having the impact that they want. Um, that said, I mean, there are plenty of financial first investors who would be perfectly happy um, if you could get them their financial floor return and sort of demonstrate some level of impact. So it really does matter sort of what segment you're in, how much the uh, measurement of social impact matters. Um, everyone cares about the financial impact, but that again, that's relatively easy to get, though as I suspect those of you who have worked in emerging markets know, that's also something that gets played with a lot. Um, so one of the things that happens is that people keep uh, two or three different books for emerging market companies um, for understandable reasons. You've um, got reasons not to want to publicly have to show that you have a lot of money in many countries. Sometimes it's just they're trying to show something different to the tax folks and they want to show to their investors. Um, so you have to be more careful on the financial measurement side than you would in a place where you have access to audited financial statements. Um, which is almost a foreign word in, in most of the countries in which we're working. Other questions? Yes? And please, please do say your name, though, just so folks know. OK, Mira, thanks. Uh, people use this word entrepreneurship. Uh, uh, people always throw around the word entrepreneurship. I think that that's what needs to be defined. What is entrepreneurship? I think it's about, I think it's about a burning talent. Um, and I think it would be, I mean, even, you know, wh what is it? I mean, it's like something that's inside of you that says, I really, really want to do this. I think the question is, how, do, how do, does an organization that's about to spend money or can have access to capital figure out how to find the talent that's out there and what is it that's burning there? So nobody grows up as a, I'm an entrepreneur. They grow up with... Uh, I make beautiful uh, tapestry. I paint beautifully. I sing. I dance. I I know how to do uh, plant. I can plant. Woman. What? I said you're a Renaissance woman if you can do all of that. No, I'm not saying no individual <laughs> is going to do all of these things. But if you can find individuals that if you can can nurture the talent, then you're nurturing an entrepreneur because that person is going to become really good at making a, a beautiful carpet or making a beautiful painting, and it's incredible when you nurture human talent very specifically to an, a human being, it's amazing what happens. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing what's happened in China. You, you know, to artists, they've, they've created an industry of just knowing how to paint, or knowing how to, how to make a sculpture, or so I, I, the word up entrepreneur puts us in a place where it's like business talk. So the question is, what is the entrepreneur, and have you defined that? Well, so, so I think I'm happy to pretty much use the, the definition that you're suggesting, which is you're trying to find people that are passionate about something uh, and that have developed an ability that they want to explore 
But the challenge is that while you might have entrepreneurs across a whole variety of, of, of sectors and spaces, whether it's art or government or public policy or business, what we're trying to do is find a way to harness that passion that does create a benefit, financial and social, um, that goes on in an ongoing way that is not dependent upon philanthropy. And so it's harnessing the entrepreneurship and trying to find the structures that allow them to have social businesses that then actually get access to the funding they need to grow. And so again, I come back to the point, entrepreneurs are everywhere, however you want to define them. Passionate people are everywhere. Talented, Talented passionate people. It's not just talent. It's got to be passion too, I think. You, you, but you've got to... But, but, so we're, but we're coming in, admittedly, we're coming in at the sort of second level, which says, we know those people exist. How do you harness that? How do you get them into a structure that's ultimately going to have an impact beyond their own personal um, brilliance and their own personal production? Yeah. Well, I'm curious, look at the example of China. I'm curious because it was brought up. Yeah. That was an emerging market. By most judgments, this would be a successful emerging market. What did they do? different than what you're doing yeah. with different parameters that would allow them to succeed where you're saying you're having so much difficulty? Yeah, it's, I mean, I think that China um, is a special case where, um, hope, you know, the, where the government played a much more significant role than most emerging market countries allow uh, to take place or have the ability to do. I mean, the amount of resources, the financial resources that China was able to unlock uh, make it different than most places that you would see. Um, and I think that you see incredible gains in China in large part, though, because China did allow entrepreneurs to start playing um, in a controlled way. But in the industries and the areas in which China wants to see entrepreneurship, and we've been learning a lot about this in the context of solar lighting, right, and solar panels, they have put lots and lots of money, erasing many of the challenges that I'm talking about in terms of the financial aspect. They also have the ability to build talent in China in a way that in Kenya and in Tanzania and in Rwanda you don't. And so um, I would love to think that China is a model that we can follow in some of the poorer countries, uh, but I'm not sure that it is. Uh, if the overall goal is to help poor people, um, there also seems to be a lot of success in micro lending. Um, tour for Kiva for entrepreneurs, also for like one acre fund that is mm -hmm. giving fertilizer and, and support. Um, you know, what are the key differences that you see, and um, is micro lending have more success now? And you see impact investing yeah. have more success later. So thanks for the question. Um, couple thoughts. Um, I was and still am to some degree a huge fan of micro-lending. Um, but there's a structural problem, and then there's the research that's been done recently. So the structural problem with micro-lending, even if it has been successful, even if you think it's awesome, you cannot build economies based on companies of one person each. And 99.5% of micro-enterprises don't grow, and a vast majority of those don't intend to grow. That was never their intent, never their interest. So even if it's successful, it, you can help families out of poverty or maybe get from poverty to less abject poverty, but you can't build economies, you can't build countries and lift countries out of poverty based on microenterprise. Then there's the research which recently has come out and was kind of a punch in the gut for those of us that are fans that say on average micro, micro lending and particularly micro credit has had uh, a neutral a net zero impact on poverty reduction. Now, this is a, a book called David Rudman, in particular, called Due Diligence, which was you know, looking at a variety of randomized controlled trials that looked at microfinance over time. There are people who disagree with this, and you can have that discussion. But clearly, what we're seeing in the more recent research is that microfinance is not the silver bullet that it had been held out to be. So we think that structurally, it makes sense and is important, in addition to microfinance, to focus on this sector, which is the next level up. So we talk about small and growing businesses. We're talking about businesses that have at least five employees that are led by growth-oriented managers that are trying to get growth capital between $20,000 and $2 million. That if you can support those businesses, they have a much greater chance to create jobs outside of their own nuclear families. 
and the potential not just to create jobs, but also to create products and services that directly serve the poor. So we think that um, without having to have an opinion on microenterprise, you need to think about the small and growing business segment as well. Could that, could that be a first step in developing some of those skills and talent that you say are so, that are so needed? That we find these like all stars of the micro lending that have grown maybe their one person business and now are potentially could be employees for other businesses? Yes. So one of the things that shocked me actually when I started this job is I thought for sure there was this great pipeline, right? That it would be five or 10% of micro enterprises that made it into small and growing business stage and then went up. But it really is like 0.1% or 0.2%. And I'm not sure I fully understand why, except that they, even more than the segment that we're talking about, lacks access to talent. Many of these are, um, are, are women and men that were never educated at all, that are in rural areas, um, and do not understand business per se. They understand, OK, I can sell my cell phone time, or I can sell milk from my cow. But taking that to the next level is actually somewhat of a challenge. So there are going to be some of them, and you are beginning to see microfinance institutions that are following their clients as they want more money. So you're seeing a migration up of microfinance institutions to serve the small and growing business segment. But it's still a really small percentage of what's happening. So I am on the talent piece. I think it is more about doing a better job at training at the high school and then the college level of the people that are attending the schools in emerging markets than it's likely to be coming from the microfinance segment. Um, let's do up here, and then we'll do it back there. Uh, right here. The young woman in the second row. Uh, could you describe one of the successful projects that Andy has been involved in in detail for us and just kind of step it through you know, a positive, something that is really positive that you've been involved in with the Andy investment money? Well, so uh, let, me, let me clarify first and then uh, see which, which way you want me to go with the question. So Andy itself is not an investor. We're kind of the industry association of these organizations. So we don't directly invest our money in the small and growing businesses. We help the 60 plus uh, impact investing funds and the corporations uh, and others to do that. So I can, I can tell you how we've been successful in bringing organizations together, or I can maybe talk about an investment um, that some of the organizations have made? Ladder. Ladder, okay. So you don't care about me? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> um, look, uh, uh, one that, that has happened um, in many different ways, but one that I'm familiar with is a group called CEIF, the Small Enterprise Assistance Funds, which would also be a good, I guess the gentleman left, a good example to look at. They've done a lot of work in agricultural lending. Pretty simple case in Peru um, called Sunshine Brands. This is a mango producer. And one of the big challenges that they had, they were, they were serving both, a, a, they were certainly serving a local market and they were beginning to serve an international market um, with relatively high quality mangoes. The CIF, however, what they really, really needed was a cold storage facility. So it's pretty simple. If you can maintain the mangoes, in, in addition to fresh mangoes, you're able to, to do concentrate, to actually do some processing. But as is often the case in emerging markets, this company did not have sufficient assets to guarantee the loan that the bank uh, was offering. And they were lucky because most of the small and growing businesses don't get access to bank loans at all um, because they want collateral way beyond the ability to do so. And they also, in particular the agriculture industry, are very hesitant to make loans. So that's a structural problem. Almost all small and growing businesses face it. This one was actually doing better. It did get a loan offer, but it was ridiculous. I mean, they wanted two and a half times the collateral um, and an interest rate, which was not ability or not, not something that they could handle. So C said, you know what, we will make the opportunity to, to, to do this loan to allow you to um, build this cold storage facility and also make connections to some of the juice companies in the United States that might actually buy this juice from you. They were supported, by the way, and this is still a really important part of the, of the overall ecosystem, by a loan guarantee from the Development Credit Authority of, the, of USAID. So one of the things that USAID can do is provide guarantees to be the first loss on loans that, um, that funds make to small and growing businesses. So leveraging this guarantee, CIF made the loan, Sunside Brands built the cold storage facility, and they have grown 
I think it was last time I checked, it was two and a half times. So they went from about 40 to um, 100 employees. And they now, in terms of sales, have doubled over time. So, and they are they considered a social business because they're in a very rural area of Peru working with indigenous people. So that's a kind of example. Um, and I'm trying not to do with all the, like, the fancy ones because a lot of this is just blocking and tackling. It is basic you know, farmer cooperatives doing coffee beans or mangoes that need the simple finance that you could get in this country that you can't find in those countries. So, I, sure. The gentleman in the back. Hi, I wanted to ask a quick question about more about the structure of the actual deals in terms of, you, you, you mentioned this last fund, they normally do agriculture. Are most of them sector specific or are they more country specific is my first question. Yeah. Uh, the second one is, you talked about exits but you kind of glossed over it. It's kind of, I guess if you're talking about the actual return, probably the most important part of the return. Yeah. Can, you, can you give a couple concrete examples of exits? Okay, so first in, most of the funds, and this actually in the state of the sector report that I was shilling, we actually have data on this if you're, if you're interested. What you will find is that most are uh, multi-sector funds, though as the market matures and there are in fact more business opportunities, you're seeing that there is a specialization taking place. Um, and where you do see specialization, agriculture is one of the ones that you'll see. You'll also see a fair amount in IT in some countries like Kenya and Brazil. But generally, if you're looking for social enterprises, they are looking across sector. So like grassroots business fund and acumen fund that I mentioned, those are cross sector funds. Most of them are also cross geography funds. Um, again, because there just weren't enough businesses in many places. There are increasingly, like in Brazil um, and in South Africa, you can find some that are geographically specific to a particular country, but it's still more common to find those which are looking at multiple countries. Um, in terms of exits, um, you know, literally, I, I can tell you some examples, but let me make the point first. This is a real challenge for the space, and I, I don't mean to gloss it over, because even like Acumen and Grassroots Business Fund, they don't have that many exits, period. And we need to know for the space to grow what the actual returns are. It would be great if groups like Acumen and Grassroots Business Fund and CIF, which actually has suggested them, these are the ones that have been around for 10 years, if they can say, we beat market rate returns, or we could, we could promise you a 7% or 8% return, something which was enough to get the financial first investors uh, intrigued and then have the social impact behind it. So, you know, CIF, again, I'll, I'll use this again, but they have a number of exits, but the way they've done it in most cases, in a couple cases, they did sell to local firms. So, you know, typical trade sale. Um, that is more common in emerging markets, as, is, as I said, than IPOs. But often, as I was trying to suggest earlier, they build in the management buyout. So they are in for long enough where you have specific um, um, targets where the manager has the opportunity to buy back particular uh, shares of, of the business. And if they see enough success, you're starting to see that. Now, the other thing I would say on this is that there's lots of interesting financial experimentation or innovation going on around the ideas of a permanent capital vehicle where you can kind of um, get exit and to kind of create a mezzanine level fund where you're actually trying to buy out these for impact investing. Um, there haven't really been any that have been created. There's just a lot of talk about it. Um, and so I think over time what we're going to see is more and more creativity in the structuring so that you're seeing quasi equity deals. So there's a whole type, and I'm sorry if I'm, this is going to bore those of you who don't like the finance, but I'll try to keep this, this clear enough where you are both taking an equity stake, so you're getting a percentage of the company, but you're also getting royalties based on sales. So instead of waiting until the end and hoping that you get an exit and you get all of your money back at one time, you're actually getting a certain percentage of sales along the way so that you, you benefit from the upside as the company grows and you are more comfortable as an investor. And you can do that in ways in which you're also giving up some of your equity stake as you're getting more of the royalty revenues in. So I think we're going to see more structures like that as impact investing grows. Yeah. Uh, my name is Tyler Hollenbach. I, uh, I work with a cultivation uh, organization in Guatemala. Um, we, we see kind of the cultivation, the giving capacity as kind of a key element over the long term in helping entrepreneurs build. But time and time again, we run into issues of institutional barriers. So with banks, like you mentioned, 
with the government itself, with um, you know even like sanitation registration, um, just just small things that are creating such incredible barriers to small micro you know organizations and and businesses. How do you see you know organizations like mine that are in the early stage of trying to build these capacities in communities? How do you see them? growing and working with larger organizations like Andy to break down those barriers? So I think the work that, that groups like yours is doing is critical because if you can't fix the kind of underlying ecosystem, and I mean that both in the natural sense and the business sense, most of these farmer cooperatives and businesses aren't going to have a chance to grow. And a lot of the capacity development is really at the level of how you tend the land how you manage your financial systems. I mean, it's like these little things that if you don't fix, no bank's going to look at you anyway. Right? You've got to be halfway decent to very decent at what you do. And unfortunately, most of the businesses that we're trying to help um, don't start out that way. They start out with lots of needs. And so within Andy, we've got probably 70 organizations that are capacity development organizations that range from those that are very specifically technically looking at agricultural practices to those that are experts in kind of creating the right business culture for growth. Um, so you know, I think it's really important to have these institutions. What I would suggest that is often a challenge um, that may be a little provocative is that far too often they rely upon the volunteers from developed countries who will come down and spend a little bit of time but not enough time to really understand the cultural challenges and build the trust that are necessary to ultimately have the impact that you need. And that the long-term solution has got to be, at least in part, building the local capacity development providers. So the Guatemalans to help the Guatemalans, as opposed to the gringos helping the Guatemalans, because ultimately um, most of us come back home. And we need to have more and more people on the ground that are trained from those countries. I think. One last question, if there is one. I'm back. Yeah. Uh, my name is Kimbo Brown Chirado. I'm uh, from Obermeyer Asset Management, but also from South Africa. Um, if you could speak a little bit about two things um, in terms of ownership structure, uh, getting the, um, basically government contracts in South Africa require um, a 50% BEE or more mm -hmm. black economic empowerment ownership. So if you could speak a little bit about, a little bit about that. Um, and then also the restrictive labor laws that um, are, I mean, it's pretty hard to hire and fire people in South Africa. So if you could yeah. speak a little bit about that. Well, so in general, I would say the BEE regulations are going to be a boon to those who care about impact investing and social entrepreneurship because part of our goal would be to help uh, the black population in South Africa to get jobs and get better jobs and also have better services, particularly in the poorer areas. Mm -hmm. So we are excited about the opportunities that the new BEE regulation will create. And it is a place, uh, as in India, where the government is actively taking a role in trying to create regulations that will have an impact on this sector. Um, in terms of the labor regulations, I mean, look, yeah, just across all businesses, I think it is generally the case that it is um, good to have moderately flexible ability to hire and fire. Um, I would say, however, in the social business space, that is less of a problem than just finding the talent to begin with. So I think in the South African context, that's going to have a much greater impact on the larger companies uh, and ossifying the labor market in that way and making it harder to get jobs than it is on the small and growing businesses that we're trying to help because they're just struggling to find the people in the first place. OK. Um, well, thank you all very, very much.